In October 1957, my dad uh, made me go into the house into his ham shack and said, listen to this. And there was a bunch of beeps on the radio and he said, that is Sputnik. The Russians just launched a satellite and uh, we were able to hear it on my ham radio receiver. And it was interested in electronics and the ham radio hobby. And uh, when I went into school, I went to, took engineering and uh, worked at uh, Channel 26 at, uh, at UNO. I worked part-time at uh, KLNG, uh, KBUN Radio, and got to meet a bunch of really interesting people there. One was uh, Mike Amdor, who went on to be a district judge. And uh, another gentleman that was working there as a DJ was uh, Chuck Hagel. Upon graduation, I got a job at uh, KFAB Radio, and uh, that launched my career in broadcasting. I was at KFAB four and a half years, and uh, it was owned by May Broadcasting at that time, which also owned KMTV, so. Uh, when I read on the bulletin board that they wanted to hire an engineer, and so I went on and I told Mikey then about that. I says, hey, Mikey, you ought to come over and work at KMTV. I started here at the KMTV uh, July of 1978. And when you first start at the station, they started everybody off on projections. We were NBC affiliated at the time and um, we were contacted by the Tomorrow program. They wanted to do a live remote from the SAC Underground. I was fortunate enough to be on the uh, crew that could go work out there, so it was kind of neat to go out to Offit, go to the SAC Underground, go underneath where all the command center was, and uh, set up the remote for the uh, general of the Strategic Air Command. Biggest thing about this kind of job is it's kind of like the Forrest Gump thing. You never know what you're going to get. You come to work, you could have a quiet day or it could be mass chaos. I got a call from one of the directors after a late newscast. Said, uh, Mike, we heard on the uh, police scanners that uh, Channel 7's tower had fallen down. Got up and looked out the window and there was a big void among, along the uh, string of towers where there's normally lights, there was one set missing. That led to a good uh, relationship with the Channel 7 at the time because we eventually had them put their replacement backup antenna on our tower while they rebuilt a a whole new structure. I had trouble with the backup transmitter downtown. Now, mind you, this transmitter was on the air during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's all tube, you know, 100 tubes in it. So I, I called up my old mentor, Roger, and said, Roger, would you mind coming out here and help me fix this thing? And, and I say he, he had humility because he called me later when I was 80, in my early 80s, to come out to help him with the transmitter out the tall tower, the old transmitter. We had a, a, a great relationship when something would break and it would be an emergency, we would be having conversations about it. We would be arguing, it wasn't really an argument, but that's how we communicated to get stuff rolling quickly to get to the end of the result. And uh, to other people, they'd go, whoa. But to us, it was just our relationship, boom, boom and we'd get the problem solved very quickly. We built a new weather vehicle out of a Nissan Rogue with no budget and loose parts laying around. We scrounged around the basement and the, the old uh, uh, boneyard of all the equipment and stuff we had and put our brains together and came up with a, a way of putting together a really functional and uh, pretty close to state-of-the-art weather tracker. He, he kind of kidded around a lot. You know, he's a great guy, super nice, funny, uh, likes to play pranks. We had a contractor working here once. He kept bragging how, how soundproof everything was and it, what great lengths he went in the, uh, the uh, air ducting to make sure sound doesn't get into the studios and stuff. He put a uh, intercom or a two-way in one of the duct work because we kept saying that you could hear voices I called him in to, uh, you know, complain about the noise getting into the studio, and and he was shocked. He just was beside himself. So it lasted for about a half hour or more until he started getting up. Then ductwork started tearing it apart, and I said, "Well, we better stop this now." When he would be on vacation, he would still call Master Control every day 
to see what the transmitter was doing. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. done that. You know, if something's eating at me and I worry about something that was a problem in the past, just, just to relax, I'll call and say, everything okay? He was probably the most influential engineer I've met in my life. I've worked with a lot of them. A lot of them keep what they know to themselves. He was very free and a, with his information and his knowledge, and I can't tell you the amount of things I learned from him. I want to say congratulations to Mike. This is well-deserving. What a great art honor, and I'm very proud of you. Hey, good deal, Mike. Boy, I'm gonna pat you on the back, and maybe I give you a kick in the rear, too, at the same time. Um, I, and I can probably speak for everybody who's worked with him, I'm a better engineer because I work with Mike Gann. Yeah, we can get through it and go back and do some of that if you want. You're going to be on TV? I hope not. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to kill your... That's all right. All right. Cut. Cut. Got to go That's again. All right. <laughs> Start from the beginning. <laughs>